so with that, I think it is time to commence the 5,526 meeting of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Rotary One is now in session. And we are going to kick off uh, the meeting with our, with our old friend, Evan Freund, with the thought of the day. Evan? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, Robert Salvin and Fernando Flores book uh, published in 2001, Building Trust in Business, Politics, Relationships, and Life. So great leaders do nothing less than alter human identity. The institutions and social patterns that provide the traditional source of ontological security and basic trust are continually disrupted. And if we're not to think of history, in the words of poet John Macefield, as one damn thing after another, we need someone who will build authentic trust in reaching for a new and partly unknown future. This cuts to the very question of who we are. Our individual identities are no longer settled and secured by our origins, our place in our families, our established roles and jobs in society. How we think of ourselves, both as individuals and as members of groups and organizations, is in a state of constant change. Human nature, now more than ever, is what we collectively make of it. Great leaders give us a vision of what that will be. So to conclude the thought for the day, uh, let me throw out the idea that is it the truth may be more complicated than we ever thought. Thank you very much, Evan. Always insightful. Really appreciate that. Um, that and uh, I don't. I don't know. Twenty twenty seems like uh, one damn thing after the other. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but your your point is well taken. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start out uh, our meeting today with a, a, a couple of announcements, just a couple of positive things that um, I wish to share with the club to get things uh, started here. Uh, one thing I forgot to pass along last week is that we did receive some 4th of July greetings and well wishes from uh, a couple of uh, locations around the world, District 3232 in Chennai, India, as well as the Rotary Club of Ra'anana, Israel. Uh, I also wanted to point out that uh, last week the board unanimously approved the five-year strategic plan. You should have received an email about that. It's also in the gyrator. Uh, so that's good news. Thanks, everybody, for all the hard work that, that went into that. Really appreciate that. Um, and then here's a good one. Thanks to the success of our annual campaign this last year, uh, Rotary One has cumulatively uh, now donated more than $3 million in total over the years to the Rotary International Foundation. So that's a pretty pretty huge milestone there. Um, so thank you everybody who over the years have helped to, to bring us up to that incredible number. Um, the next thing that um, we are going to do here is just a little bit of a survey. And let me just kind of preface this. So now we get to uh, an interactive portion of the meeting. So you all have to pay attention, uh, at least for a few minutes here. Um, obviously, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, we've been meeting remotely via Zoom, and, and hopefully that's working out for, for everybody. Um, obviously, like every other organization, we continue to monitor the situation and understand how things have changed and are changing. We're in phase four now in the state and in the city, which means um, buildings are open, but with limited capacity and, and so forth. Um, and I, I just want to make sure I kind of understand where everybody's comfort level is uh, right now. First of all, let me say that whatever we do moving forward with meetings, even whatever day, uh, whatever month we end up having in-person meetings, um, a Zoom component will still be part of our meetings. Um, so I want to get a sense for what people are comfortable with, 
um, in terms of meeting uh, in person in the future, because I don't want to do anything ever that puts anybody at risk here. Um, and I uh, and also, uh, if we hold in-person meetings and only I show up, then uh, there's really not much point to that, is there? So. Uh, right now, Karen has just put in the chat box a survey form, and if you could click on that and just just take a minute. It's just two questions. Uh, it's very simple. Basically, we just want to know um, if we were to, to have an in-person uh, outdoor meeting, uh, obviously in the summer, probably not in December, uh, would that be something that you'd be comfortable with? And then the second question is if we met in, inside, at the Union League Club, when would you be comfortable uh, meeting meeting inside? Um, and so this, this would really help us a lot if you could click on that link and answer those questions. If you have any trouble at all, um, you can also feel free to just answer those questions into the chat box. And I'm gonna give everybody just, uh, just another 30 seconds to, to answer that. And of course, while, um, while we're talking here, that link is still there and it's still live. So if you uh, are just chiming in right now, uh, you, can, you can click on that link at any time during the presentation. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, just to keep things moving along here while you're answering that, um, I want to uh, move on to the program portion of our meeting today. Uh, and I want to start out by introducing the immediate past president um, of the Rotaract Club of Chicago, uh, who did a fantastic job leading the Rotaract Club this last year, uh, really got them thinking strategically, uh, provided a lot of input into us, and uh, often we're sort of tagging along with their great ideas for programs and volunteer events. So it's certainly been a pleasure working with him over this last year, and I, I look forward to continuing to do that. So let me introduce to you Mr. Donner Call. Thank you, Eric, for that lovely introduction, and hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. It is with great pleasure that I introduce today's speaker, Paul W. Hammond, President and CEO of the Knight Ministry. The Knight Ministry compassionately provides housing, healthcare, and human connection to those experiencing poverty or homelessness. Last February, with the Knight Ministry, my Rotaract Club was able to serve Chicagoans by supplying a meal of hot chili and warm conversation on a frigid day at not one, but two locations. We were able to see firsthand the important resources the Knight Ministry provides underserviced Chicagoans. During Paul's tenure as president and CEO, the Knight Ministry increased the number of beds for homeless youth by 280%, initiated case management services, and implemented electronic medical records. The Chicago Community Trust named Paul as one of three nonprofit experienced leader fellows for 2012. Also in 2012, the White House named Paul a champion of change in the fight against youth and family homelessness. Paul is frequently called upon to speak on the topics of board development, developing a culture of philanthropy, and creating LGBTQ culturally, culturally competent workplaces. Please help me in welcoming Paul Hammond to center screen. Thank you, Donner. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much, everybody, for having me this afternoon. Uh, it's been a while since I spoke at a Rotary Club. I was telling Eric earlier that uh, when I lived and worked in San Francisco, uh, I did a lot of speaking at the uh, Rotary Club of South San Francisco and also uh, in San Mateo, California. So thank you so much for having me. And, and Donner, I'm so thrilled to know you've had the experience of going out and serving a, uh, a soup supper on, on our bus. That's, that's fantastic. Um, first of all, can everybody see the screen? Just a quick nod, yes or no? Perfect. Great. Thank you. So uh, this afternoon, I'm going to spend some time talking about the general state of homelessness uh, in the United States and kind of narrow it down to our city. Uh, then talk about the Knight Ministry and our response to homelessness and kind of go into some of the challenges that, that we face and other service providers face, um, not only in this city, but across the country and, and trying to meet the challenges um, presented by, by homelessness in our, in our communities. So hopefully we can do that all in 20 minutes and have some, uh, have some time for, for questions and or comments afterwards. So just a real quick word about words. Um, 
and this is something that always makes my skin crawl, so I'm just gonna be really honest about that, is oftentimes I hear us talking about the problem of homelessness or homelessness or homeless are a problem. Um, that kind of rubs me the wrong way, those of us who work in the field, um, because that means if homelessness is a problem, then the homeless are a problem. And we work, at least I work from the philosophy that homeless and individuals are not problems. Um, we have a challenge and a social issue regarding homelessness in this country. Um, but to say that it's a problem also brings up the idea that it can be wiped clean, uh, every problem can be solved. And unfortunately, um, the challenges presented by homelessness uh, as is experienced here in the United States are incredibly complex, which I'll get into in a little bit, uh, and are just nothing that can be solved with, the, with the, a flick of the wand. So I try to tend to avoid that, that word during my presentations. So you oftentimes hear me talk about the challenge, uh, challenge of homelessness. So taking a step back to the big picture, um, these are the latest stats that we have from 2019, every January HUD, that is the Federal Housing and uh, Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development does a, um, a survey of those who are on the streets. It's called the point in time counts. Um, go on my soapbox a little bit. It's, I'm, I think it's not a coincidence that they do this on one of the coldest weeks of the year when the largest number of people are most likely to be someplace safe. Uh, but last year, 2019, the uh, number that HUD came up with was about 567,000 individuals on the streets, uh, homeless in our country at one time. Uh, I can tell you, this is an undercount and we'll get into that reason in a few minutes. Um, but 567,000 in the country as a whole. This slide, I took this data from the uh, National Alliance to End Homelessness. You can kind of see how those 567,000 um, are kind of how they're categorized. Uh, 396, almost 400,000 are, are individuals who are on the streets. Um, more than 171,000 on that one night are members what we call intact families. That is families who are homeless on the streets that one particular night. Uh, we have chronically homeless individuals. Uh, chronically homeless are those whom we tend to think of typically as being on the streets. Uh, maybe you have the image of the shopping cart or somebody sleeping in a, in a, in a, uh, in a sleeping bag. Uh, 37,000 veterans and 35,000 youth underneath the age of 24 who are unaccompanied uh, on the streets in this country every year. There's also a breakdown there too of who is sheltered and who this is isn't not. Um, and you can see that largely families are, tend to be the group that tend to be in shelters the most. Um, we hear a lot about homelessness a lot in this country, especially on the West Coast. I think you know California certainly has been in the news a lot. Um, these three star, the, these five stars on this map show uh, places in our country that have developed are declared a state of emergency for homelessness. This means that the challenge of homelessness in their communities is so prevalent that by declaring a state of emergency with homelessness, often like you would do after a disaster, a natural, a natural disaster, it allows for different types of resources to be diverted differently to help address homelessness. So we have uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, We've got Seattle and then parts of Oregon and also the entire state of Hawaii um, has declared a state of emergency with regard to homelessness. Here in Chicago, let's bring it back home a little bit. Uh, according to the uh, Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, uh, nearly 77,000 individuals homeless last year in the city of Chicago. And when you take that number and compare it to the number that HUD has, you're thinking, wow, we've got you know, quite a bit of the number of homeless in this country. But actually that points to the challenge of the fact that there is no single definition of homelessness in this country. On the federal level, there is no single definition of homelessness. So therefore individuals are counted differently uh, by different, different types of criteria. But the number that we generally tend to use here, uh, and this is based on an aggregate from the data management system that all of us providers use as about 77,000 individuals here in Chicago throughout the course of a year are homeless. Those 77,000, um, you can see here, um, there's about 12,000 who are homeless youth. 
Uh, some of them, uh, a large number of them are staying with other individuals, but are still without safe and stable housing. Uh, nearly 1,200 on the streets. Again, families you'll see here uh, make up a, a large number of, indi of the individuals who are homeless. Um, nearly 30,000 in the city of Chicago, 30,000 individuals, families with children, um, but 23 of those, 23,000 in, in shelter. So uh, this is how that number breaks down in Chicago, but I just wanna caution again that these numbers are very, um, I, I'm not gonna say suspect, they're not suspect, but uh, it's a hard uh, working on data management with regard to homelessness is a challenge because uh, people's lives ebb and flow and sometimes they are stably housed and sometimes not stably housed and sometimes counted or not count, double counted or not counted at all. But this is the number that we're looking at here in the city of Chicago. So a little bit about the night ministry, uh, a little bit about where, who we are and where we're at. And some of you have had experiences with us. Um, we've been around for close to 45 years. Uh, we were originally started by a group of congregations on the north side of Chicago who realized their ministers got together once a month for lunch and fellowship and realized that there were individuals on the street at night um, whom nobody was looking after, nobody was taking care of. Largely, they were looking at the uh, Lakeview and Lincoln Park neighborhoods. Uh, and they were kind of curious as to who's on the street at night, uh, what are their needs and what can be done to help them? Because most of the traditional social service agencies close their doors at you know five or six o'clock. So they pooled their funds and they hired this guy by the name of Tom Barons, who was a minister and also a mortgage banker. Uh, and he was, uh, he's, they formed the night ministry with him. Tom was our only employee for the first 12 years. Uh, he literally ran the organization out of the trunk of his car. Uh, but while he was on the streets, he learned about the needs of adults and homeless who are um, adults and youth who are homeless. On the adult side, he learned about the needs for medical care. Uh, and then on the youth side, he just learned about the needs for shelter because at that time, not a whole lot of people were paying attention to homeless youth. Um, so from a one person uh, organization for the first 12 years, uh, we've grown into an organization with 162 employees. And this fiscal year looking at about a $10 million operating budget. And Tom is currently retired and lives, lives up on the North Shore. The Knight Ministry uh, has two lines of services, if you will, two lines of business. We have five housing programs that on a nightly basis can house up to 61 youth, ages 14 to 24 for anywhere from overnight to up to two years, depending on the program and the age of the, of the young adult whom we're working with. Uh, last year, we served 455 youth and 47 of their children. So we are one of the few organizations in the city that actually works with homeless mothers who have young children with them um, and they're underneath the age of 24. Uh, what's, uh, Bonner had experienced was going out and working and serving a meal on our health outreach bus. Um, this is the bus you see here. This seems to be the thing that we're known the most for in the city. People see it on the streets a lot. Um, that's a 38 foot mobile health clinic that uh, is on the streets seven days a week, uh, working in underserved neighborhoods, not only with individuals who are homeless, but those who are precariously housed and what we call one paycheck away from homelessness. And here you see a volunteer group we always try to have during non-COVID times and some type of meal uh, provided by a volunteer group. Last year, we had 50, over 51,000 contacts with individuals in need off of that health outreach bus. That's not 51,000 different individuals, but 51,000 times that individuals came to us. Uh, and we served over 1,200 patients with our medical services. Uh, our medical services off the bus are, we're not a primary care provider. We do a lot of linkages with primary care providers in the area, but we deal a lot with individuals who for some reason or another don't trust the medical system. Uh, but also too, if you're homeless on the streets, um, it's safest for you to be awake during the, um, it's safest for you to be asleep during the day. So therefore, when you need medical care, you're awake at night because that's when it's, you need to be awake for your own safety and all the medical clinics are closed except for ERs. So we do a lot of work with individuals who are not able to access medical care during the day. Uh, nurses largely focus on 
uh, blood pressure situation, stroke prevention, a lot of pe uh, podiatry issues, and a lot of wound care, individuals who've been released from the hospital too soon after surgery, uh, a lot of respiratory issues, asthma, that type of thing. Uh, also, as a component of our street outreach, we have our street medicine team um, that's on the street six days a week, uh, largely working with individuals who live underneath the viaducts, uh, live along Lower Wacker Drive, live along the, the, um, the highway. Uh, last count, I believe we had identified 47 places in the city where there are more than five individuals living together outdoors and in camp. So a couple of years ago, uh, diving a little bit into our work with youth homelessness, there was a big study done, the first study ever, on the, um, the needs of homeless youth and their numbers in the United States. Uh, and that uh, study showed that there are, in one year, uh, 3.5 million homeless youth ages 18 to 25, uh, with up to 700,000 of them being unaccompanied. So you see a great disparity between there and the HUD numbers that I presented before. Three of the uh, biggest causes of youth homelessness are a lack of high school diploma, the young person is parenting or pregnant and alone, and they've been kicked out of their house because of uh, issues around uh, gender identity and sexual identity. Uh, at the Knight Ministry, we have programs that respond specifically to those needs. We have our RAP program, which is the only program in the city of Chicago that has beds for minor girls who are parenting and pregnant and homeless. So if you're only the age of 18 and you've got a child or you're pregnant, we are the only agency that has beds for you and your child. Uh, young ladies come to us oftentimes pregnant, eight or nine months pregnant, not having had any pre, uh, pregnancy care. So we immediately get them linked up with care. Our staff attend to them when they're in the, the delivery room, bring the child home, um, that type of thing. We also operate Phoenix Hall over in North Lawndale. I understand that you've done some work with uh, the North Lawndale Christian Health Center. This is a program, one of very few like it in the United States, that specifically focuses on homeless high school students. There are over 16,000 students registered homeless with Chicago Public Schools. 16,000 homeless students enrolled with Chicago Public Schools. Again, a great disparity compared to the HUD numbers. Uh, that program is called Phoenix Hall. There's some of our student leaders who help us develop the program. And then we have the crib, which is our overnight emergency shelter for LGBTQ individuals, uh, ages 18 to 24. 60% of the youth are um, identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer. And 12% are transgender or gender nonconforming. Last year provided over nearly 5,500 nights of, of, of beds, bed nights to that, that population. Um, and we just moved this shelter last night. Last night was our very first night of providing beds in our new location on North Ashland Avenue in Bucktown. Uh, previous to that, for the last nine years, we've been located in Lakeview in the basement of a church. So those are some of the ways in which we meet the needs of homeless youth. But one of the things we have to be conscious of when we discuss homelessness, like I said earlier, it's incredibly complex cannot be waved away with a magic wand, therefore it's not a problem. Uh, I always tell them when I go out and speak that unless, at this, unless we are willing to address social concerns around equitable housing, access to affordable housing, healthcare, education, access to living wages, unless we're able to address the concerns around race and poverty in this country and parents who are not accepting of their youth, unless we're able to really deal with all those things at one time, we will never solve the challenge of homelessness. This homelessness results oftentimes from a tsunami or a coming together of these, different ish, of these different concerns happening at once in a person's family. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm gonna be homeless and sleep on the streets tonight. It doesn't happen that way. It results from a variety of factors and situations that occur over a period of time, oftentimes involving these challenges. And we just have to take a look at some numbers. Uh, with regard to race, we know we've learned a lot the last month and a half uh, with regard to the fact that this country still has uh, things to deal with with regard to race and racial inequities uh, and, and racism. You take a look at those who live in deep poverty in this country, the vast majority of them are white. 
but when it comes to homelessness, it's nearly equal between white and black. So we have to ask, we have to say that homelessness is not just a matter of poverty, but for black individuals, it's a matter of access to housing. And we know that this country has uh, a pretty horrendous history of redlining um, back earlier last century that resulted in a lot of access to housing and the ability to, to build up equity. So, I mean, you take a look at statistics like this and you know that you need to be able to, we need to be able to address racism at the same time that we address homelessness. One cannot be addressed without the other. Uh, mental health concerns. And the general population, it's about one in 20 individuals has, gen has a mental health concern. Uh, homeless, it's about one in five. So nearly 20% of homeless have been diagnosed with a mental health condition. Again, you can take a look at the, which one caused the other, but until we deal with mental health and mental health services, there's no way we can adequately address homelessness. Uh, substance, same thing goes for substance abuse. Um, we know that substance abuse is a concern amongst the homeless. We see it a lot on the streets. Uh, but, you know, you can play the chicken or the, you can ask the chicken or the egg question, but until we have adequate treatment that's available for individuals who need it, that respects their dignity, there's always gonna be this disparity. Uh, some of the hurdles we face in the last couple of minutes uh, and providing homeless, homeless services, not only in this city, but across the country, there's no unified definition of homelessness. Health and Human Services, HUD, and the Department of Education all have their own definition. So I might be serving a young person at one of our HUD housing projects that's funded by HUD, but that person would not be considered homeless by Health and Human Services or vice versa. Um, our, current our current policies as this country, in this country when it comes to homelessness are not focused on those overly represented populations like I just talked about. So for example, 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ identified, but there's no concerted effort to reach out to that particular um, that particular subpopulation, all the, even though they're overly represented amongst the homeless population. Right now on a federal level, we're facing the situation where the focus and the funds are going towards what's called rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing for those who are homeless. That is, uh, as soon as somebody is homeless, we try to get them into housing right away to get them stabilized. Uh, but my focus, our, our challenge to the system is that until such time as enough, of, enough affordable housing is available, then who's gonna work with individuals who are on the streets? Our work on the streets for the health outreach bus receives no federal funding because that type of outreach is not a priority for the federal government. It's all about the bricks and borders. Uh, our homeless systems are adult focused. So if I have a young person in one of our HUD funded programs, and that person, that youngster, that young adult, we support them and they graduate from high school and they get into college and they go into a college dorm. That is not considered a success by HUD because according to the HUD definition of successfully emerging from homelessness, you have to be into your own apartment and paying your own rent. So an adult system with adult definitions of success that don't apply to youth and are not developmentally appropriate. Uh, our local continuum of care, that is the agent, the coordinated effort in the city of Chicago that disperses federal funds around homelessness, has made huge strides in the last several years as far as how it's coordinated, but we still lack a lot of coordination in that area. And then also too, there's a lack of local support for some services uh, with most of the emphasis again being on the housing, uh, but not a whole lot of emphasis on taking care of those who are actually still on the streets while they're waiting for housing to become available. I'm not gonna go into this, but you can see HUD's definition of, of homelessness versus the Department of Education. Uh, HUD, if you are homeless and living in a hotel, does not consider you to be homeless because you have a place, you have a roof over your head. The Department of Education, however, understands that if you're living in a motel or hotel on a transient basis, you're homeless. So these are some of the things we have to deal with on the federal level. And until those type of things get coordinated, effective policy around serving the needs of the homeless, I'm afraid uh, is gonna be a, a ways off. Um, you're gonna see here a lot, probably during this election, about ending homelessness. A lot of people say we're ending homelessness or they have plans to end homelessness. 
please, I beg of you, know that they're not talking about any more, no more people being on the streets. The federal definition of ending homelessness means that communities have a system in place to prevent homelessness. And if somebody does become homeless, their occurrence of homelessness is, um, is going to not be repeated and they're going to be, um, their experience of homelessness is going to be brief and non-reoccurring. So when you hear people or politicians especially talk about ending homelessness, please know that they're not talking about nobody being on the streets. They're talking about a community meeting these three criteria. Because until we address all those other concerns, we cannot address the needs of the homeless. That's my soapbox. Real quick to wrap up, at the Knight Ministry, we are all about accepting and affirming relationships. We understand that the homeless whom you see on the streets or individuals who are temporarily housed someplace have oftentimes been rejected. And Tom, this is one of the things that Tom Barron's, our president, learned the very first night he was on the streets is that individuals are on the streets because they have no personal safety net. If something were to happen, I think, to one of us, we would have a friend we could call up or a family member and say, can you take me in for a couple of days while things get squared away? Those who are on the streets don't have access to that personal safety net, which usually means that they're lonely and they've been rejected a lot. So the Knight Ministry, our whole entire philosophy is on developing, accepting and affirming uh, relationships as the cornerstone of our working with people. It's not so important as to why you got here, but let's talk about the future. We don't care if you're gay, straight, bisexual, lesbian, black, brown, yellow. If you have a need and you come to us, we'll serve you. I oftentimes tell the story in wrapping up to, to exemplify this, that a couple of years ago, we received a check for $5,000 in the mail from somebody who explained to us that he was in the need of a HIV test, because we do a lot of HIV testing on the streets. He came to the bus, we took him in, we worked with him with no questions asked. He was not our typical client. He was actually a, a, a businessman here, a business person here in Chicago, but was so moved by the fact that we didn't ask him about his qualifications for services. We just knew he was in need. We took him in and provided him with what he, with what he required. This is what we mean by accepting and affirming relationships. No questions asked. An individual should not have to stand in line or fill out tons of paperwork in order to get services or to get a hot meal on the street. Real quick, we're at 1735 North Ashland. That's where I'm talking to you from now. You may know it as the mural building as you're driving down the Kennedy. This is our new home. We are leasing the first floor. It's for the crib or overnight emergency shelter and the second and third floors for all of our administrative back office functions and program administration that used to be up on Ravenswood Avenue. Picture at the top is what our first floor looked like back before construction began. Uh, pictures on the bottom are that area now. Uh, dining room for the 21 young people whom we serve every night and beds in the dormitory uh, facing the Kennedy. So that, that space on the first floor of the mural building now looks like what you see on the bottom two photos. Uh, and then again, the dining room for the crib. The mural was designed by youth who are in our programs. And this is just part of our staff work area up on the second, third floors. So we're thrilled to be at 1735 North Ashland. It took us four years to get here, four years to find the property, go through zoning, get financing, do construction, but our youth moved in last night and we cannot be more excited. We've been very responsive to COVID. Um, just some stats there. Uh, our staff have been working 24 seven in programs that normally all, only operate sometimes overnight. We've kept 162 young people safe and indoors during the pandemic. Um, and we've done over 689 COVID screenings. That does not count the more than 150 uh, we were doing once a week, one night a week on CTA because we expanded our outreach services to the CTA because that's where a lot of the homeless ended up sleeping. So I've talked a lot. I know you have a limited amount of time for your meeting. I just want to say how thrilled and proud I am uh, to have been with you this afternoon and to thank you for all the work that you do worldwide and all the great projects that the club supports. Uh, you guys really help to create the kind of lasting change that uh, the world needs right now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Paul.
um, and right back at you. What you're doing is really incredible. And, and I think what you've shared with us today is also very eye-opening um, about the, the challenges that lead to homelessness, about uh, particularly the situation with the youth and students and the LGBTQ community in regards to homelessness. Um, so let's start with a couple of questions that folks have put into the, the chat box here. We've got a, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Um, the first one is really focused from our member, Anita Nagvadi, and it's really focused on education and job skills, um, really about kind of helping to, to educate and give good job opportunities and maybe even job placement and how that leads to economic independence um right. do you guys dabble in that at all and if 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 not um any thoughts on on that so huge need uh, i think uh whenever time we do a survey of homeless youth and what their needs are there's always two big needs three big needs that come up housing education and job job assistance those are always the three big needs um we ourselves do not as you said dabble in that work our focus is really on keeping people safe keeping them, uh, getting them ready for the next stage of housing or serving their needs on the streets. However, we do partner with some wonderful organizations around the city that do that work. Uh, I think probably our best partnership actually in the youth housing area uh, has been up in Evanston with uh, Evanston Youth Job Center. They've done a great job with our youth. Um, but one of our primary things we try to do um, is to make sure our youth, when they leave us, they have access to some type of uh, funding. So when a, a young person is in our two-year transitional living program, they have to be working or they have to be enrolled in school. And when they're with us and they're working, they have to save 60% of their money with us. That way they can start to um, gather savings for the next stage housing. So we're really focused on keeping people safe, keeping them off the streets. Sometimes when a young person comes into our shelter, they have no identi uh, identification whatsoever. So you need an ID to get a job, you need an ID to go to school. Sometimes just to get an ID from the state takes up to six weeks. So we're focused on the very, very basic building blocks that they need to be able to go on and get those other services. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense, that makes sense. And just out of curiosity, another question, follow-up question here is, is who is best positioned to address these issues? The feds, states, cities? All of the above? Well, uh, yeah, I would say all of the above. I think that the leadership has to start on the national level. Uh, there has to be a lot more coordination uh, between the different cabinet level departments. Um, and then it's got to work down. Um, we've seen, we had seen some great progress on the federal level. I think a lot of that has dissipated. Uh, but I think it has to, no matter what, it has to be everybody who have got their fingers on the pulse coming together. So uh, you have to have the Department of Family Services, you have to have the Department of Health, you have to have housing at the table. Um, the leadership needs to come from all different levels, but it's only when the different departments actually come together and work together that you can, and start to coordinate that you can really have the effective change that we need. And unfortunately, that just doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, un understood. And, and kind of a sort of a similar question, less on the coordination side, uh, where does your funding uh, come from? Yeah, so we're very fortunate. We have a diverse portfolio of funding. Uh, we have about 27% of our funding comes from uh, government, that most of that is federal and city. We only have one state grant for which I'm, I'm grateful we only have one state grant. Um, we have about 40% comes from foundations and corporations. Um, and then the rest of the balance of that comes through, uh, comes through individuals or, or family foundations. So uh, the Knight Ministry, um, our board of directors made a very concerted decision back in the 1990s to invest um, in developing individual donors and getting that robust donor database together. Uh, and we're very fortunate that, that those funds are usually unrestricted. Uh, Chicago's got a wonderfully generous philanthropic community so we do have a very robust individual giving program. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, one of our members uh, has asked to, uh, to uh, verbally ask a question. Member, uh, I remember Ellen Harris. Uh, okay. you've, got, uh, you've got the mic. Uh, please uh, ask Paul a question. Hi, Paul. Hi, uh, Ellen. Hi. I was um, uh, one of the leads of the Chicago Coalition with Homeless for 10 years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, with 
uh, John Donahue. Oh yes. Les Brown. And I, I was wondering um, if you're, you know, the coalition addresses all of these uh, city, mm -hmm. state, and federal issues, and we helped start the McKinney Act. Mm -hmm. So I'm, we're all homeless funding comes from. I'm right. wondering if you're still working with them on campaigns. Oh yeah, yes. Uh, Doug, Doug and I are in communication frequently. Uh, and I think the real gift of the coalition is that they do a great job in organizing around city and state issues. Mm -hmm. uh, they got some wonderful legislation passed the last couple of years on the state level. So mm -hmm. we still very, very much coordinate with them. And you know, the coalition was really, did a great job during the pandemic. Uh, when we realized the great need for sanitation in the encampments, since individuals mm -hmm. couldn't go to restaurants anymore, they worked really well with the city and get, you know convincing the city that this was a need and getting those kind of uh, getting those kind of services and resources out there. So, yes, yeah. um, we and the coalition also, I believe that once a month they still come into a legal clinic at the crib uh, mm -hmm. for youth. So yes, that's great. Yeah, I, I was yeah. there during the time when we pat, um, was able to get, it used to be illegal to shelter minors and we got that law changed. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so anyway. Just, yeah, probably working with Tom Barron's our founding president on that. Cause yes. I know that he yes, and Les I know worked, Tom. Yeah, I he knew and Tom, Les worked yeah. a lot on the state level with that. Yes. Uh, Rule That's 410. Awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very you much Alan. for your work on that. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, thanks Paul. Um, I think we have one, maybe time for uh, one more question. Uh, David Hirsch, did you um, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, um, <clears throat> Eric. Uh, Paul, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I'm inspired by the work that you do and the mission of the Knight Ministry. Um, my question is sort of a two-part question. One has to do with the definition, because it seems like a slippery slope yes. I don't know how to describe that. And uh, the other had to do with volunteering. So as it relates to the definition, um, is by definition, if somebody is homeless for a night or a week, what qualifies as being homeless and what's the trend? That's my first question. And then the second is, uh, what are the best opportunities for individuals, Rotarians or others, to get involved in night ministry? Okay, thank you. Um, so the definitional issue is huge. Uh, it is big on the federal level. There are lots of disagreement around it. So um, on the HUD level, you have to be chronic. And then, but the Department of Education realizes that, you know, if you are an intact family and living with another family doubled up, you're homeless. So there is, you know, I'm gonna be blunt. <laughs> um, HUD likes to keep the definition narrow because it keeps the numbers small and then says that we have resources to deal with this. Health and Human Services and Department of Education takes the, the broader perspective, which scares people because then it inflates your number. I'm just, this is the way it works, I'm just telling you. Um, so there's been legislation introduced in Congress, I believe every year for the past four years and it never goes anyplace the way it is, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a great organization and I'll be perfectly transparent here. I sit on the board of directors in DC of an organization called the National Network for Youth. We do a lot of lobbying on Capitol Hill for homeless youth providers and homeless youth themselves. They're really the ones who've been trying to, to really get the definition issue uh, passed, passed through Congress. Uh, with regard to volunteering for us, we love volunteers. We are just now starting to accept a few volunteers back because we had to stop volunteering, involvement of volunteers for COVID. Our, our website has all sorts of information about volunteers. So on the group side, the, the primary way that groups volunteer for us is, as Donner had talked about, that's going out and providing a meal off the health outreach bus. We try to have that meal every night at every stop because it's an important part of our hospitality and getting people to come to us for services. We also on the weekends have opportunities for, for me, providing meals at the crib or overnight emergency shelter. And on the individual basis, individuals work off the bus, they work in our shelters, they work our administrative offices. Uh, to be an individual volunteer, we do have a 12 hour training program the individual needs to go through plus background, background checks. Uh, groups like the Rotary, if they don't want to serve a meal, we are always in need of things like deodorant, um, have a deodorant drive, please, we need deodorant. It's not sexy, but everybody needs it. We oftentimes forget about it. 
Um, again, our website has a list of different things that we need at different times. Uh, you can do a drive around those type of things, uh, as always very helpful. Uh, the other things that we always need, especially around the holidays, are five and $10 gift cards for Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's. Um, those we can put in people's stockings. We use those oftentimes as incentives for the youth whom we work with. You come in the shelter, you do your chores, get a gift card. So uh, there's a wide variety of ways you can volunteer, um, even though it's, it's in the time of COVID. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I think, why don't we continue this, uh, this conversation after this meeting and make sure that we share information with our members and come up with some opportunities for us to volunteer with the, uh, with the night ministry. Um, also, maybe the possibility of doing some tours of some of your facilities probably mm -hmm. once, uh, once COVID <laughs> passes, um, I think would be fantastic for, yeah. our, uh, for our members. Uh, let's give uh, Paul a round of applause, everybody. Thank um, you, and thank you all very much for the opportunity. I, I, it's been an absolute thrill. Uh, well, and to be with the number one club is quite amazing. So that's cool, glad, thank you. Glad to hear that, glad to hear and, that, and, that and Paul. Eric, I, I will also send to you the name of our individual on staff who deals with our group and individual volunteer opportunities as well. That, that would be great, great. that would be great. Um, and we do have one, one thing for you here because we mm -hmm. do try to give a, um, a gift to all of our speakers that um, basically supports a community-based organization so that we can affect lasting change here in Chicago. Now, have you ever heard of an organization called Bright Endeavors? Uh, yes, yes. You have, yeah, it seems right in line with your mission. So we're going to send you a candle. And so as you may know, all proceeds from these candles actually yes. support their mission to empower young moms by providing yes. transitional jobs, professional skill training, exactly what we were just talking about. And this not only helps those young moms, but it supports their kids and obviously the, the communities uh, ultimately. Right. And that's very consistent with our own community service focus this year on education. So um, Perfect. we will send that to you with our thanks and our, our gratitude. And uh, let's stay in touch, Paul. Great. Thank you all very much. And I do have a one o'clock I got to go to. So otherwise, I'd love to stay for the rest of the meeting. But again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, next, we're going to move on to our assistant governor for District 6450. Um, and we basically sat down recently to chat through understanding how assistant governors help clubs that are within their purview. Every assistant governor has a couple of clubs and they act as a liaison with our district. And I said, well, instead of explaining it to me and me explaining it to everybody, let's just Let's just uh, have you on the show here. So I'd like to introduce our assistant district governor this year, Mr. Mike Theodore. Mike, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Eric. And uh, Eric was very kind to uh, invite me over to his place and uh, we were able to have a good long talk about all the great work that the club is doing. I was, I was greatly impressed with the strategic planning effort and how that has laid out a lot of your goals or has, has laid out the structure of your goals this year. That is definitely a, an initiative that Rotary National and the district has been pushing clubs to do for a while. And uh, it's, it's good to see Rotary One once again leading the way on that. And uh, I'm looking forward to see a lot of successful results from that. So like you heard, my name is Mike Theodore. I'm the, uh, your assistant governor this year um, with the Rotary Club of Chicago Lakeview. Uh, I have to say I'm I'm really excited to be working with this club this year uh, and to be able to assist the amazing work that you're doing and to, uh, to, to learn more about the, the work, the, uh, learn more about the structure of the club and, and meet more of everyone here. So just real briefly, the, the role of the district uh, for assistant governor is to uh, effectively serve as a liaison, to be able to make sure you're connecting with district resources and making sure you're getting the most of the service the districts are offering you. And I want to make sure during this year that, uh, especially once we're able to meet back in person, that we can have open conversations about uh, how the district is serving you, what the district can be doing better, and what kind of services uh, can we potentially connect the club with the district and uh, certain steps we can take in that regard. So it's it's early yet. I am looking forward to be able to attend more meetings and to uh, get a better idea. 
Uh, but just to start, uh, you all probably seen an email from, uh, from Governor Chuck Gorgon. There's going to be a special event tomorrow, uh, Making Rotary Work for You. It's going to be at, uh, at noon. And this is going to be an announcement relating to uh, a partnership of 6440 on expanding vocational partnerships. Uh, it's it's going to be, a pre, uh, from what I understand, a very exciting opportunity for the district and for all the clubs within it. So uh, be sure to tune in that if you can. If not, I'm sure you'll hear more about that. Uh, and like I said, feel free to reach out to me. I want to be as open as possible if you want to have conversations about how the district can better serve your club. Uh, I'm, I'm an open book. Feel free to send me an email, give me a call at any time. And that's all I have. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And and thanks for keeping it short. I, I appreciate that. That's always helpful. I try. Excellent. But uh, do I am looking forward to having you back at uh, any meeting you want to attend. Uh, obviously, it's very easy these days. So looking forward to see you, seeing you again. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so I want to move on to the next segment uh, of our of our meeting here, uh, which is something that we're calling the service spotlight. So speaking of the strategic plan that, that Mike mentioned, um, one of the things that came out of that is we wanna make sure that people within our club, our guests and people outside of our club all know the great service projects that we're doing every year. Uh, and so we, we start by, by showing and sharing those lists of projects that, that we're doing every year. And then we kind of, zero in, we sort of focus in on one of those, and we'll try to do that um, just about every week. Last week, we had an international project. So this week, we're gonna focus on a community project here, uh, here in Chicago. Now, before we get into this, um, this segment today, I do just wanna let you know that we don't have time for questions during the segment itself, but we will have time at the end of the meeting uh, for folks who wanna stick around and, and chat about this. So to introduce um, our, uh, our speaker and our presenter today for the service spotlight and the service project, I would first like to introduce our community service co-chair, Sarah Buck. Sarah, the floor is yours. You might be on mute, Sarah. Are you there, Sarah? Well, um, not. I'm. I'm not hearing Sarah. Um, and so uh, maybe. Sorry, uh, I'm oh, here. There you are. Okay, you are. <laughs> it's that mute button every time. That 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 darn mute button. The whole button. conversation we'll, to just myself. We'll we'll get that mute button fixed. Don't worry, Sarah. Yeah. The <laughs> user error actually. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have Adam on today who's going to talk to us about one of our um, projects that we helped fund the Illinois Medical District Guest House. And um, there were some pictures that went out in the um, gyrator, if you have a chance to see that. And um, I believe there's a video that should be along with this as well. So hopefully that made it into his presentation. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Adam and I will mute myself again. All right, well, Sarah, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks everybody at Rotary. It's great to be at a meeting and see so many familiar uh, faces and names uh, of people from Rotary One, as well as to see a lot of new names and faces as well. Uh, so a little bit about IMD Guesthouse and how Rotary One has helped us. Uh, within the last year. Um, for those who aren't familiar, uh, IMD Guest House is an independent nonprofit. So we're in the Illinois Medical District, but we're not formally connected with it. We provide temporary lodging for medical patients and their families when they come to Chicago for medical treatment. Um, a lot of times in Chicago, we don't think about going away for medical treatment because we have such great hospitals here. but Many times people need to come here to see a specific doctor, get a certain kind of treatment, and uh, they'll need a place to stay when they're here. We're the only organization in the Chicago area that is open to patients and caregivers of any age receiving any kind of medical treatment, any diagnosis, 
inpatient uh, families, outpatients and their families. Um, and also we never turn anybody away for a lack of funds. Uh, so we are a 501c3 charity. We certainly want to make it possible for people to uh, complete and receive life-saving treatment. Uh, some of our core guests are cancer patients. So think about somebody who needs a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant, and they need to be here for six weeks, eight weeks, three months during that period, they need to be near the hospital, but not in the hospital. So that's kind of a core patient group for us. Um, transplant patients, organ transplant patients, much the same. Uh, we have a big group of neonatal ICU or NICU patients and pediatric patients. Um, there are some doctors at Rush who do a lot with uh, very rare special needs pediatric patients. So we have a big group of, of patients with those conditions who come through. And then in the non-medical world, we do work with veterans who are getting uh, treatment for PTSD uh, through a program also at Rush, that's one of our partner hospitals called the, the Road Home Program. Um, so we have 47 apartments. Um, one or two bedrooms, they're all in one building here uh, at the corner of Polk and Damon in Chicago. Uh, where the rotary funding really came in for us and where it was especially helpful this year uh, was during the COVID period. So we never closed down during the COVID period. We always stayed open because people still need that kind of treatment. Uh, but our traffic slowed down um, as only truly essential medical treatment was going on uh, during the last quarter. And uh, so that impacted us. Um, what we did with some of our excess capacity was to provide lodging for medical professionals from our partner hospitals who needed a place to stay near the hospital because maybe they couldn't go home. Some of them had infant children at home or another high risk person at their home, or they were working very long shifts at the hospital. So, uh, we qualified for support from Rotary One and we're very grateful for it, uh, for a grant just to help us continue to operate uh, based on providing lodging for frontline medical professionals because after all, they were working hard under great stress and literally great risk to their physical safety. So we're very fortunate for that. Um, final comment and then we'll show a video, I hope, um, why we exist. So. There's sort of the functional element of that, which is that no matter what else happens in healthcare over time, um, advanced care gets more and more concentrated in big, big city, big academic medical centers. Neighborhood hospitals get smaller, smaller city hospitals become more and more restricted. And if you are seriously ill or someone in your family is seriously ill, more and more you have to come to a big hospital like Rush, University of Chicago, University of Illinois. Um, and so there's sort of a, a natural sort of pressure to bring people into Chicago. And we really support uh, people who come here for that reason. So that's sort of the functional reason, but there's also an emotional reason for why we exist. And the video will really touch on that. And that is that, you, you know, almost everybody in, in this group, because everybody in America has, has experienced a time when somebody in their family is seriously ill. And if you can remember that back to that moment, uh, there's a sense of isolation that a family feels at that time. And if there's, they sort of see, feel cut off from most of the rest of the world. And by providing community, uh, which is one of the things we were very hard at uh, through our volunteer program and through volunteer activity, we really provide some connectivity and some ways for people to feel like they are still people and not just a diagnosis. Um, we're restarting our volunteer program. So what you'll see in the video is are things that we did in more familiar times and things that we hope to get back to. Uh, and we hope to work with Rotary on a volunteer basis on a forward going, um, forward going. So, with all that said, thank you so much for your support. 
thanks all for your attention. And um, if we can run the video, that would be great. It's very short. Well, I am Ken Whippick, and I was a caregiver for a cancer patient. My wife was diagnosed uh, about five or six years ago with um, uh, mantle cell lymphoma, uh, which is a progressive cancer. Um, she uh, was under the care of physicians uh, as an outpatient for a number of uh, years, but in late 2017 and uh, early 2018, it became clear that they'd need more proactive treatment. Well, I first set foot in the guest house in probably April, and we stayed through June of that year. Um, it was uh, uh, a great environment for me because while it would have, while Sheila, my late wife, had to stay isolated, um, I was still able to connect with the community. Now, in a hotel room, some or some other place like that, it would uh, it just would not have been possible to to get any really sort of feeling of community. And, and that I certainly found, um, your, uh, the IMD Guest House community room uh, was especially wonderful and provided uh, snack lunches, snacks, and every Thursday was a, was a very nice meal uh, prepared by outsiders. And, and while I almost always enjoyed those meals myself, I would I'd find early in the process I'd be bringing food back to Sheila, and then later in the process, she was able to uh, join that community there. And, and the IMD Guest House is a, is a great environment. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, first of all, I just want to say it was really great to see you again. <laughs> Likewise. Likewise, absolutely. Yeah, thank goodness for the magic of, of Zoom. We hope to, to see you on uh, again. You're always welcome to, to chime in whenever you, you have some, some free time. We'd love to, love to see you again. Well, thanks so much. And thanks again to the club for uh, the support of IMD Guest House and for your attention. Great to see everybody. Uh, take care and be well. All right. Thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate that. Uh, let's move on just to very quick introduction of our guests because we do have a lot of announcements today and I want to get everybody wrapped up by 120. And by the way, uh, Adam, if you're willing to stick around, anybody who has any questions for Adam in the IMD guest house um, will leave the Zoom, uh, Zoom meeting open for folks who want to stick around when we're done and you can talk to, talk to Adam. Or if you're just an old friend, just, just stick around and say hi. So uh, for our guests uh, today, uh, we've got a couple of international Rotarians, uh, Valdemar, I believe you're, uh, you're still on, just your name and your Rotary Club and what you do, very briefly. Hello, uh, President Eric, uh, thank you very much. I'm Valdemar from Germany, uh, in, my Rotary Club is in Witten, but I travel a lot to Poland. So now uh, many greetings from a wonderful sunny, um, uh, day in, in Warsaw, Poland. So have a good time. Uh, our borders are open for uh, for travelers. It's it's a good news. Wonderful. Well, you're always always welcome, and it's good to see you here again. Thank you very um, much. You you bet. Um, uh, and then we've got uh, let's see here. We got uh, Josh Gajuski. Are you uh, are you still on, Josh? Um, not uh, not hearing anything. So then we also have Nagin Sunkara uh, from uh, River City, India. Do you want to just briefly uh, introduce yourself and your club? Yeah, I am Nagendra Kishore Sunkara, Rotary Club of Rajminder River City, RA District 3020. I'm a sports and community psychologist. Uh, last year, uh, this is one year and seven days back, I had the great opportunity of visiting Rotary One. Uh, uh, greetings to all of you. I pray God Thanks. to bless you all with everything good and excellent. Thank you. Well, same to you, sir. And hopefully we'll Thank be uh, open again for uh, in-person visits and we'll be able to see you again sometime in the future. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm waiting. We have a couple. Of, uh, same here. We have a couple of other guests as well. Uh, Karen Dennis, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? 
uh, Karen might not still be on. So, uh, uh, Bonnie, uh, I know that that you're on because I saw your your note about the IMD guest house and uh, night ministry. Why don't you briefly introduce yourself? Me? Are you still on? Talking yeah, about Bonnie. <laughs> Talking about you, Bonnie. <laughs> Sorry, I hit. I was like, wait, is he other Bonnie's here? Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, Adam. Nice seeing you. Uh, I, I am Bonnie Sanchez Carlson, and I am, well, I was assistant governor. Now I'm assistant governor coordinator. Uh, I'm with the Rotary Club of Chicago Near South. And Eric, thank you for um, the invitations for for joining in. I love hearing your presentations. Uh, delightful, uh, including the Night Ministry, our organization, our, our club has uh, participated in the Night Ministry. And I also currently uh, lead the coalition for all of the Chicago clubs. And uh, with, with that, we some, sometimes we get together for service projects, fundraisers, uh, social time and uh, so th these were great presentations to, to be at today to to remind us of how we can get together as a coalition uh, and to, to provide some service out there so uh, you know thank you Eric for for recognizing me here online <laughs> oh you bet Bonnie it's always a pleasure to have you on so you're always welcome thank you very good so um, all right Buckle up, everybody. We've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of announcements here. A lot of things going on. You all asked for hands-on volunteer opportunities, and when it rains, it pours. And so we have a monsoon of volunteer opportunities, but it's all good stuff. So tomorrow, July fifteenth, American Diabetes Association Volunteer Packing Day. We have five people signed up. Uh, more are always welcome. It's downtown in the Loop. Registration required. We have an Englewood food distribution where we are providing, I believe, about a week's worth of food to a thousand, and that is not an exaggeration, a thousand different families uh, down in Englewood. That's on the 17th. We need volunteers between 12 and 2 to set up. Uh, that's down at 6619 South Halstead. Uh, information on both of those events is in the gyrator. Uh, and then the Jesse White trunk party is back. We weren't sure if it was going to be this year, but it is. And we need volunteers this Friday, July 17th, in the late afternoon and evening. Um, we also have uh, Saturday, July 18th, for the Jesse White Trunk Party, uh, 11.30 to 3. Um, and uh, more information is in the gyrator there about how you need to dress, make sure you have your masks, social distancing, um, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, the announcement on the Rotary Network uh, was already mentioned, but tune in tomorrow at 12 p.m. to see this announcement on how Rotary can work for you professionally, particularly in this time of COVID-19. Um, all this information is again in the gyrator. Uh, Rotary International is also hosting a webinar on diversity equity and inclusion in Rotary. Uh, so drop in on that, on that event. Uh, information is again in the gyrator, the link is in there. Uh, and just in general, RI is continuing with their virtual breakout session throughout the month of July. Um, in terms of other meetings going on uh, with our club, uh, we have committee meetings uh, basically uh, on the calendar. So just check the calendar. I don't need to go through each of those here, but do check the, the calendar. Um, and then there's also, believe it or not, uh, we have a in-person social meeting coming up. Um, and it was something that sort of happened organically. Our, uh, our new member, uh, Liba, uh, organized it uh, more just to get together, I believe, with for drinks with, with me, and then we realized it was uh, uh, on the third Thursday, so we might as well just open it up. Uh, it's basically over at Diversity and Lakeshore Drive in Lincoln Park. It's outside, so you're basically in a giant lawn. There's a, there's a bar there, uh, but do make sure that you bring masks. All social distancing protocols will be followed. Uh, we will have hand sanitizer and 
and such. Uh, we also have a couple of great upcoming meetings. We have next Tuesday, Lewis Braxton III. He's the former deputy center director for the NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, that, that program will be in partnership with the Chicago Engineers Foundation. He's gonna talk a lot about the future of space exploration. It's really interesting, it's interesting stuff. If you have any kids who are interested in outer space and space exploration, you should definitely bring them on to the meeting. The week after that, July 28th, we have Crane Kenny. Uh, he is the president of business operations for the Chicago Cubs. Uh, whew, all right, got through those um, announcements. I. I Somebody did just point out to me uh, before we get to the four-way test that I may have missed a guest or, or two, and I apologize about that. Tried to pick everybody up, but somebody must have snuck in uh, on me. Are there any other guests out there, um, either Rotarians or non-Rotarians, uh, that uh, did not get an opportunity to introduce themselves? If so, you can, you can certainly speak up now. Uh, Bill Blue in Chicago Lakeview. I checked in late, but I always enjoy uh, with your meetings and today's presentations were especially uh, uh, meaningful. And I want to say thank you to Bonnie. She taught me how to use the Zoom a few meetings back. So anyway, so Bonnie, good to see you again too. So thanks, Eric. Always good to be with you folks. Yeah, you bet. Good to see you again, Bill. Good to see you again. Um, anybody else? My name is Elke Friedman. I joined you a little bit late. I'm from the Rotary Club of Northbrook. Unfortunately, we meet at the same time when you do. So I'm always torn that I really cannot uh, follow your program so much, but it was very interesting. I thank you very much and good luck to all of you. Well, thank you very much, Elke, and really uh, great to have you join. And uh, you're always welcome to, to drop in whenever you can. Okay, well, very good. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining today. And as always, uh, we wrap up our meeting with the, the four-way test. And today, reciting the four-way test is going to be our friend from uh, River City, the River City Club in India, uh, Nakin Sunkara. So uh, Nakin, if you could uh, please recite for us the four-way test. Nagin, you might be you might be on mute. Yeah. Of the things we think, say or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fate to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thanks for the great opportunity. God bless you all. Thank you so much, sir. It was good to see you. Hope to see you again in the future. And thanks to all of our friends, members and guests today for, for joining the meeting. Let me remind you again that Adam is going to stick around. If you have any questions for him, uh, please do the same. Uh, with that, the meeting is adjourned.